Now all of my life I freely 
everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble
us to surrender today to you, Lord. Thank you that it's never too late to surrender. Thank you that you're there with arms open wide for us, Lord. give you this time today, God, and we thank you. It's your time. Side in the center. So good morning, everybody. Great to have you guys with us today. Uh, one more time, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. Now, uh, not every person necessarily thinks that Mother's Day is a happy day. Not necessarily every mother has enjoyed being a mom. We, you know, I, we just want you to be conscious this morning because we are focusing on mothers this morning. And now for a lot of us, they're like, all right, I'm checking out already. <laughs> but listen, even though we're focusing on the role of motherhood this morning, this is a message that applies to every single one of us. And, and you'll understand why here in a moment. But just kind of as a disclaimer, you know, Every, you know, people respond to Mother's Day in different ways. We've got, we've got mothers who, who were born to be moms, right? You know, they just live and breathe their children. You've got mothers who uh, maybe were, were forced into that role unexpectedly or without having planned it. You've got people here who love their mothers. You've got people here who maybe hate their mothers for different reasons. So there's a huge spectrum, you know, that we all basically fall into. If I asked for a raise of hands, who has a mother? Everybody would raise their hands, of course. Duh, we're here, amen? But if I asked you if you loved your mother, a few hands would go down. If I asked you if your relationship to your mom was complicated, you know, a few more hands would go down and so on and so forth. So going into this message this morning, this time together, uh, I hope we can go into it with open hearts and open minds, uh, understanding that we all, again, fall into different categories. Uh, you know, we're, we're all going to have different memories and different relationships with our moms. And so I'm going to share a little bit about my story, and, and hopefully that will kind of open things up a little bit. Um, and hopefully it will ultimately draw us all closer to our, our Savior, uh, closer into our relationship with, with, our, with our Savior. Amen? Uh, so before I share, uh, well, let's go ahead and stand. We're going to read from uh, Matthew chapter 20. Verses 25 through 28, and then uh, we'll, we'll get into our time together this morning. So this is Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, 
verse 25, we read, But Jesus called his disciples to himself, and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, Father, we lift up this time to you this morning. And as we uh, will set this time apart to hear your voice and seek your face, to reflect upon the truth of your word I pray that you would find us collectively in that posture of surrender that we have just sung about, Lord, that we would truly be in that place of humility, Lord, where we are willing to listen and willing to respond to what it is that you want to say to us today. So we trust you with this time. We commit it into your hands and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, please have a seat. Uh, we, yeah, okay, that's on. We can uh, bring up that first picture. So I was born in New York City. I was born in 1965. This is my mom. And her name was... Don't get me going. Her name was Jean Marie Maddox. She was married to my father, Matt Maddox. I was born in New York City, and I was born during the age that in America we call the, the boomers generation. It was post-World War II when all of the soldiers returned from fighting, and you know, within a year or two, the, the baby booming uh, you know, thing started happening, and so it's called the generation of the, the boomers. And by the time my mom and, well, by the time my brothers and I, you know, st started growing up and my, my mom and my dad were stepping into their careers, uh, they had essentially, they were in show business. I'll, I'll just keep it simple. And one of the reasons we lived in New York City is because both my mom and my dad were involved in Broadway. And so, uh, go ahead with the next picture. My mom, that's not my dad, by the way, just so you know. But that is my mom. <laughs> uh, they had arrived at the American dream, you know, particularly in that generation. They were successful uh, artists in Broadway, in the entertainment industry. We would say they had hit the big time uh, show business. And that was largely on the basis of the accomplishments of my father, Matt Maddox. Go ahead, the next picture. That's my mom on theater, uh, on stage. Go ahead, next picture. So that's my dad, Matt Maddox. Some of you will recognize that photograph. If you're, if you're a MGM music fan, you, will, you, you might recognize him. This is him in his role as Caleb on the film Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. He was, this was kind of the peak of his dancing career. And he, like I said, they had arrived. And they were living in the lap of, you know, luxury, as it were. And uh, my mother, in her own right, was a very accomplished dancer. She danced on Broadway, as you know. She was in RKO Films. She worked for Universal Studios, MGM, and even in the Greek theater in Hollywood. Uh, but she basically lived under the shadow of my father, who was really, you know, in the limelight, if you will. He was still, to this day, he's not with us anymore, but to this day, if you look up his name, Matt Maddox, you'll find him immediately online. He was a legend in jazz dancing. Anybody who's familiar with the dance world will likely have heard his name. My father danced with Marilyn Monroe in Heat Wave on Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. He danced with Judy Garland and some other really big names. But this was what he would call his commercial phase of his career. And he was quite disillusioned with Hollywood and everything else. 
And he had this burden, if you will, to go into a more purer form of dance, which he eventually became famous for. And he left everything to pursue his dream, including my mother and my brothers and I. My father left to pursue his goal as a, you know, a famous dancer, which he did realize. But it only came at the cost of his family, one of several it would turn out to be. And when he left my mother, he left in the midst of a scandal. My mother was 45 years old when she found herself alone with three boys. My brother Christopher, my brother Matthew, and I, we had a 12-year spread age-wise between us. I was five when my father left, and as a result, I have very few memories of him. My brother Matt was nine, and my brother Chris was 12. He was the one that was the most impacted that is besides my mother. You see, when my father left, my mother's career, for all that it was worth, ended immediately. She now found herself having to uh, survive and figure out how to raise three little boys. We moved from New, uh, New York to New Jersey, on to New Hampshire, that's, you know, the uh, New England, Northeast USA. And with each move, things became more difficult, work became more uh, scarce, and my mother was struggled to make ends meet. She was always there in my life, but she was not around because she was working so much of the time trying to put food on the table, clothes on our back, a roof over our heads. And as a result of that, I grew up largely without any authority figure in my life. I knew my mother, but I, I can't say that I knew her well. I loved her, but again, she was a bit of a stranger to me. And times were tough. I can remember the conversation with my mom. She was stressing out about finances. And I remember I had seen something on TV recently about people eating food out of trash. And I had asked her in our kitchen, Mom, are we going to have to eat food out of the trash can someday? That's how clear, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of memories from that time. But I remember that fear, you know, thinking, what's going to happen to us? Even though I couldn't have possibly comprehended, really, you know, what it all meant. But... You know, when I look back on my mother's life, I know, I, I believe I should say, that she probably considered herself a failure. Her marriage, her career, and, you know, even her ability to care for her kids being strained as it was, I, I believe she believed she was a failure. I remember a conversation I had with her around 10 years old. I had spent the weekend at a friend's house, and, you know, they had a really, you know, great family, and everything was together, and the food was amazing, and I, you know, my friend was a good friend of mine, and I remember driving home with her after that long weekend and saying, Mom, is it okay if they adopt me? <laughs> now, it sounds silly, but it, my mom started crying, because that was just like, you know, I think, you know, I didn't know any better, right? But it hurt her. And it was a reflection of where she was at at that time. I think all of the stress ultimately uh, killed her. Go ahead. That's her, by the way. That's my brother. That's me in the middle and my two brothers and my mom. Uh, next picture. That's her. My mother got... Uh, cancer. I think she was probably 53 or 54 in this picture. This is actually a photograph of her on her last vacation in life in Greece. That was her dream, to go to Greece, interestingly enough. And right after this picture was taken, she would return to America and start chemotherapy and eventually succumb to her fight with cancer at the age of 56. I was 16 years old. Now, for me, that was a license to go off the rails. I was already in trouble. I was already experimenting with drugs and everything else by the time she had gotten sick. And her sickness was just an excuse for me to kind of throw 
caution into the wind. And when she died, that was it, man. I was just like, you know, game on. I, I just started throwing myself into uh, drugs and the whole party lifestyle, which lasted for 10 years. Got, kept graduating from one drug to the next. Finally ended up strung out on heroin in and out of jail by the time I was 26. And it was in jail that I got a hold of a Bible and started reading the Word of God, and Jesus met me there in that place and saved me from my sins. Hallelujah. Now, obviously, this is a super condensed version of the story because this story is not about me. It's about my mom. And the reason why that Bible found its way into my hands. You know, I, there was plenty of things to do. Well, I don't know if plenty is the right word. There's enough things to do in jail to keep myself occupied. But I was lost. I was sober for the first time. I was looking for answers. And the first place I turned to was the scriptures, was the Bible. Why? And the, reason, the answer to that question is because my mother took me to church every Sunday. It's crazy because it took, I didn't really even, it didn't really dawn on me until last year. Until last year. You know, I'm 58 years old and it took all this time for me to come to this revelation. I don't have a lot of memories of my mom. I didn't know her as well as I did, but the most consistent memory I ever had of her was in church on Sunday morning. And even though she didn't have time for much of anything else, she made sure that we were in church and that we were, you know, in, under that influence of, of God's word and God's people. You know, Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says this, as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and, and it does not return there, but waters the earth. And makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. My mom, whether she realized it or not, whether she was conscious of it or not, she was sowing the seeds of faith into my life each and every week. And I certainly didn't appreciate it. You know, we were joking last week about having a drug problem. Somebody drugged me to church, right? Yeah, that was me, you know, as a little kid. I hated going to church. But it was there that I heard about Jesus. It was there that I came under the influence of the scriptures. My mother wasn't perfect but I believe she knew the one who was. And so she brought me to him as often as she could. And so those seeds were sown and those seeds were watered and those seeds would bring forth fruit in the darkest, most difficult season in my life. You know, I don't remember my mother ever asking me for anything. She was always sacrificing and always serving. And as I am looking back at her life and I'm thinking about motherhood in general, you know, again, regardless of what your relationship to your mother may or may not look like, in, in essence, motherhood embodies the spiritual discipline of, of servanthood. Servanthood. You know, we talk a lot about servanthood in the church. And indeed, that's the scripture that we started off with this morning, right? Jesus, you know, is, is teaching his disciples this new way of thinking, this new way of living. He's defining to them the economy of God's kingdom. And he says, you know, in the world, those who, who want to be great do whatever they have to do to accomplish it. They exercise authority over others. They, you know, and the, yes, the idea there, you know, as Jesus is talking about the world's idea of greatness and the world's idea of exercising authority, uh, you know, we can look around at our world and we see it everywhere we look. This sort of 
cutthroat, kill or be killed mentality that it takes to really rise, you know, financially and successfully in, in so much of the world. We see and we read about people who are willing to lie and, and betray and abandon people so that they can get ahead. We see it around us, people who are willing to, you know, hack and slash and tear and stab in the back to get over the next hurdle, the next person. This is the very mentality that my father bought into. He wanted to become this great person in the dance world, and so the only thing it cost him was everything. He was willing to leave his wife and his children, and I mean leave, like no looking back. We see it in the world around us. Jesus said, you know, people who are willing, they're, they're seeking to gain the whole world, but they have to lose what in the process? Lose their integrity. Lose their marriage, their family, their respect. Lose their conscience. No, well, yes, yes and no. Jesus says lose their very soul in the process of trying to obtain this elusive worldly ambition. This attitude is still very much prevalent in the world we live in. You know, even here on our beautiful island, we see it. Heartless, unscrupulous employers who are willing to work their employees to the bone for nothing. Don't even get days off. You know, we see this, this killer instinct that you need to get ahead. Darwinian job ethics. Kill, uh, survival of the fittest, right? But Jesus said it won't be so among you. If you're here this morning and you consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus, there's no room in your life for that sort of mentality, that sort of lifestyle. Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. Whatever, whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever wants to be great among you, let him be your servant. Notice that Jesus says, whoever. Hallelujah, that's good news. That means that there isn't a single person in this room. I don't care what your past looks like. I don't care what your education, skin color, language, social status, whatever the case may be. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you can be. By Jesus' definition, all you have to do is become the servant of all. Really? <laughs> Jesus, is that the only route? Because the Holy Spirit's going to put that desire in you. If, you. if you belong to Him and the Spirit lives within you, He's going to give you that burden to do something with your life for Jesus, to make a difference in the kingdom of God, to make a difference in your generation. And hallelujah, Jesus said, whoever desires to be great in the kingdom of God, let him be your servant. That means it doesn't matter if you're a pastor or a janitor. It doesn't matter if you're on the worship team or the cleaning team. It doesn't matter whether you're high profile or you're, you know, serving in a capacity that no one sees you. You could be a televangelist or a closet intercessor. Yeah? God's going to gauge our, our, our greatness, if you will, on our willingness to serve, to serve Him and to serve others. Listen, 
The Bible says that servants, not celebrities, are great in the kingdom of God. When Jesus was preparing to leave this world on the final day of his life, the night of the Passover, when he was instituting the new covenant and uh, you know, spending the last few hours of his life with his disciples, we're told there in the Gospel of John chapter 13 that Jesus gave one last life lesson for his disciples before he would be arrested. One last life lesson before he would go to the cross. And what was that lesson? Was it a lesson in, you know, biblical hermeneutics? No. Expository preaching, perhaps. <laughs> no. We don't even see him teaching them anymore about prayer or performing any miracles. His final life lessons to his disciples is found in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 12, where we read this. It says, when he, when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down. So, so Jesus had literally gone around the table at the Last Supper and he had washed the feet of his disciples. Now, culturally, that was unheard of because that was a, a duty that was reserved for the lowest level servant in any given household. You know, a person's feet were dirty, and, and especially by from Jewish standards or perspective, re religiously and everything else. You know, to wash someone's feet was a humiliating task. And here Jesus quite awkwardly and uncomfortably washes their feet, much to the complaints of many of his followers, including Peter. And then we read, so when he had finished washing their feet and he had taken his garments, he sat down again and he said, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Listen, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, listen, here it is, blessed are you if you do them. As always, we find that biblical theology, biblical discipleship always produces behavior and not just belief. Behavior and not simply belief. Theology, doctrine, obviously all of these things are radically important, but it, if it doesn't translate into Christ-like living in our lives, Jesus said to his disciples, I've given you an example to live out in the world. Listen, there's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do well in life necessarily as long as it doesn't rob us of the most important truths that as we belong to God, that we're, we're functioning in that capacity and calling in our lives and that we're never losing sight of the fact that we have been called to be a servant of all. That it's one thing to be great in this world. It's a whole nother thing to be great in God's eyes to be great in the estimate of the kingdom's economy. And one of the reasons why servanthood is such a challenge for us is because it requires humility. It requires for me to serve the person next to me, to, to put their interests before my own. It requires humility. It requires what we were singing about earlier. Surrender, dying to ourselves and, and putting others before ourselves. Humility is an antidote for arrogance. <laughs> and we're born arrogant. We're born with pride. We're born with that sinful nature that you know, says, I can live without God. I don't need him. I don't need his truths, his laws. I don't need his spirit. I don't need his help. I'll do the things my own way. That's our old nature. That's 
full, that's rooted in, in, in pride and arrogance. And one of the reasons why Jesus made such a big deal about you know, learning how to develop the heart of a servant is because it, it's so closely associated to the transforming work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a person to humble us and make us more like Him, more like Jesus. You see, when we humble ourselves, when, when we're willing to make ourselves a servant of others, we move ourselves under the flow of God's grace. And I don't know about you, but I need all of the grace I can get my hands on. I need grace in my marriage. I need grace for my children, for, for our ministry, for our friendships and, and relationships, for all of it. And if we don't think we need God's grace, that again, that, that's our, our pride. And when I think about what it looks like to be a servant, when I look around and I, and I say, what does a servant look like in the world today? I can hardly think of a context where it is not more obvious than that of motherhood. And again, I know that conjures up different response from different people, but we're, we're talking about generally a, a, a relatively healthy mother is the embodiment of servanthood. Tell me another job that is more thankless, more underappreciated. Tell me of another person who is more uh, taken for granted than a mother. You know, there's a great, great chapter in the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. And there, you know, you've, you've got this section in Proverbs 31 that talks about a godly woman. And I, it's easy for me to read because I'm not a woman. <laughs> I'm like, hey, honey, have you read Proverbs 31 lately? <laughs> easy way to get myself in the doghouse, right? Yeah. <laughs> You read that passage about the heart of a mother, the heart of a, of a godly woman, and, and you, you think, man, there's not enough time in the day to be this kind of a, a person. I mean, just look at the, the resume. It says that she willingly works with her hands, rises while it's yet, yet night, and provides food for her family. Her household, uh, her household is clothed. Her lamp does not go out by night. Nor does she eat the bread of idleness. I mean, just in those handful of scriptures, you're thinking like, when does this woman sleep? <laughs> well, that's the whole point. She doesn't. And most mothers don't. I'm continually amazed. I, two of my three daughters are, are mothers now. And I'm, my youngest especially, I'm shocked at how she functions on so little sleep. <laughs> And does such an incredible job in the process. You see, when we think about servanthood, Lord, you've called us to be servants of all. If you want to find a good example of what that looks like, find a good, find a, a good mom. Servanthood is not a popular idea. It's not an easy life to live necessarily. It requires the Spirit's strength and help and power. Let's look at a, a couple of quick passages where we have this idea of servanthood being fleshed out a little bit. The Apostle Paul, for example, speaking of his love and, and heart for the, the people he was serving... He writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, 15. He says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. I think, man, how many moms can say amen to that? You see, Paul was simply mimicking Jesus here when he said, I, I would gladly 
spend my life, have my life spent upon the salvation of your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am, I am loved. Jesus poured out his life for you and I. And by his own, you know, in his own words, he says that is the, the, the greatest demonstration of his the willingness to serve others, the depths he was willing to go to to serve you and I, to lay down his life. And listen, if you're here this morning and you're wondering how do you know that God loves you, the Bible simply says God demonstrated his love in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for you, for me. And that death on the cross, that where he substituted himself for us, where he stepped into that place where the wrath of God was justly due to be poured out upon us, he stepped into that place of judgment on our behalf and took it all. As the Bible says, he drank the cup of God's wrath to the dregs. Not a drop left for you and for me. And that was the ultimate demonstration of how far he was willing to go to serve us. The greatest demonstration of the heart of a servant that we will ever find. And you read again in Philippians 2.17, Paul would say it this way. He says, I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and the service of your faith. And I am glad and rejoice with you all. And a drink offering has very powerful pictorial implications. A drink offering was when a cup full of some beverage was brought to an altar and it was just poured out before, before God as an offering. And Paul says, my life is a drink offering. It's being poured out. For the sake of the church, for the, for the purpose and the ministry of my Savior. And when we think about this concept of being spent and poured out on behalf of others, when we think about this in the context of, of mothers, just me personally just thinking about the career that was sacrificed. How many dreams have been postponed? How many ambitions never realized in women's lives because they've put their families first, put their children first? The blood, sweat, and tears of collective motherhood throughout history that has empowered their families and their children to go on and be better people than, or accomplish more than they were able to accomplish themselves. You know, when the Apostle Paul wanted to paint a picture of, of what he saw ministry as, servanthood as, he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1, he says, let a man regard us apostles. He's talking about the apostles, right? These guys were unique in their position, and in their influence. And he said, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ. The Apostle Paul, this man who gave us 13 letters of the New Testament, whose life so powerfully impacted the first century church. And while on one hand, you know, he would defend his apostleship, he would, he would when necessary, he would stand up and say, hey, I am, I am an apostle by the will of God. But when he was among friends and among those who, he says, listen, let a man regard us as servants of Christ. And that term servant means an under oarsman. And just in case you're wondering what an under oarsman looks like, if you've seen the film Ben-Hur, you know. Go ahead and you can bring that up. This is what an under oarsman looks like. Paul says, let men consider us in this regard as Servants of Christ, under oarsmen. That's glamorous, isn't it? 
being chained in the hull of a boat, never seeing the light of day. Your only purpose in life is to row to the beat of the drum. Don't even know where you're going or where you've been. Fortunate if you get a square meal on a given day. These men were prisoners. These men were criminals. And this was their sentence in life. And if anybody was going to go down with the ship, it was these guys. It was almost guaranteed, seeing that many of these ships were ships of war. And Paul said, let a man regard us as servants under oarsmen in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Timothy. Now, how do you and I envision Christianity? Let's bring up the next picture. This is, this is us today. There we go. That's more like it. Where's the spritzer? Where's my cold and refreshing drink? Right? <clears throat> Forgive me, I couldn't resist the temptation. But, but that is, unfortunately, too often the mentality that we have. Like, come on, God, let's get this show on the road. You've made promises. Where are we going? When are we going to get there? Huge difference in mentality, in heart, in attitude. Listen, I like a good vacation as much as the next person. Don't get me wrong. It's not trying to guilt trip or belittle or condemn anybody here. But the reality is, is that we've been called, all of us, mothers or not, to be servants, to have that heart of a servant, at least to, to be walking in the footsteps and the example of our Savior. And there's just not any room for pride in the hull of a ship. Listen, our destination is sure, hallelujah. We're going to heaven. We, we're going to heaven. Amen? Amen? Eternal life, that's the destination. We know where this ship is going, amen? But until that time comes. God, give us the heart of a mother, the heart of a servant. Listen, if you're here this morning, and again, you know, we, we all have had different experiences with our mothers. We, I understand that there are, you know, there are those who love being mothers. There are those who wish they could be a mother. We have, we have maybe some who are bereaved mothers who lost their children. You've got adopted, surrogate, spiritual moms. All different shapes and sizes. And when I think about, you know, my mom's life and looking back, I, you know, I have every confidence I'm going to meet her again someday. I had a good friend of mine, the mother of a good friend of mine who, you know, was alive when, uh, during that whole season of my life. And she assures me that she came to faith in Christ. I remember her being surrounded by people close to her death, praying for her. And I have every confidence that I'm going to see her again. And by the way, just if you're wondering, I, I reconciled with my father towards the end of his life. That's a story for another time, but a beautiful story. And maybe you're here this morning, Mom, and you feel like a failure for whatever reason. It's crazy because, you know, if you're a working mother, you're going to get condemnation. What are you doing working? You should be home with your kids. If you're at home with the kids, you're going to get condemnation. What are you doing at home? You should be out making a living for yourself. You know, I, for a lot of moms, you just, you'll never get it right. You'll never do enough. And you may believe the lies of the enemy who would want you to, you know, feel like a failure. <clears throat> Don't buy that lie. Sow the seeds into the lives of your children while you have the chance. And, you know, Paul said, one sows, another waters, but it's God who gives the life. My mother never saw 
I was a mess by the time my mother died. And I'm pretty convinced I made her life pretty miserable in those final days. But the seeds she sowed in my life broke ground 10 years later. So don't give up. Don't buy the lies. Press on. Stay strong. Keep your eyes on Jesus. What legacy will you leave for your kids? For a lot of us, for a lot of families, the mother is the last line of defense in the home. With all of the noise and all of the garbage of the world trying to find a way into the house, a way into the family, through their devices, through their friends, through whatever. Moms, stay strong. The Bible says, Therefore, beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. There's no guarantee how your kids are going to turn out. Even the best parents sometimes have to go through the most difficult experiences with their children. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Recognize the privilege that God has given you as a mother. For the rest of us, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You know, we're all familiar with the famous parable that Jesus taught about the talents. And we all love the end of that story where, you know, the master of the house comes back and he finds the talents have used their gift, their, their, in his investment wisely. And he says that famous statement, right? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm pretty sure we all want to hear those words when we arrive. So, Father, we thank you for your word and the work of your spirit this morning. <clears throat> Lord, uh, Lord, you demonstrated the things you said. Your words were never empty, but were always lived out. Lord, you said, to love our enemies. But you didn't just say it. You, you, you showed it on the cross. And we were those enemies, Lord. All of us had our hand on that hammer. All of us had our hand on that scourge. And we were enemies of God. And yet, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. From the cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Lord, you have called us to walk in your footsteps to, on some level or another, live out a life of humility and servitude. And Lord, that's going to look different for each and every one of us this morning. But for you, that ultimately came in the form of a cross. A cross that you chose to bear on our behalf. And I pray this morning, if there's anybody here who has not come to that cross, that today would be the day, Lord, where they recognize that they are so far from you a holy and just God. But that you have made provision, that you have sent your Son, you have poured out blood in your desire to redeem us to yourself. And I pray this morning that, <coughs> that those who don't know you would come wherever the ground is level. The whoever's, Lord, 
who are responding to that conviction of your spirit to become something in the kingdom of God. Grant them faith to repent of their sins and turn to you, to bow the knee and confess you as Lord and Savior this morning. Father, pour out your spirit. May today be the day of salvation. Lord, for those of us who are already sons and daughters, we pray, Father, that you would strengthen our hearts to become more like you. Again, Lord, pour out your spirit. Conform us into the image of your son. Lord, strip us of our pride and our arrogance. Humble us and bring us to that place of surrender. Lord, where the, the flood of grace can flow in, into and through our lives. Lord, we thank you. Lord, for our mothers here this morning, God bless them, strengthen them, encourage them, meet them right where they are. Lord, be the lifter of their heads this morning. We trust you for these things, and we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise this house in vain, the builders try to to